Hey everybody, Michael Steele here. I'm so glad you could tune in for this episode of the Michael Steele podcast because it's a little bit different, particularly given who our guest is uh, this this time out. Uh, Mary Trump is joining us. Uh, she is uh, a clinical psychologist holding a PhD from the De Derner Institute of Advanced Psycho Psychological Studies at Adelphi University. She has taught graduate courses in trauma and developmental psychology. She is also the host of the podcast, The Mary Trump Show, uh, and author of the international number one bestseller, Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man. Um, and we don't talk a lot about that dangerous man on this episode of the podcast. I really wanted to tap into her expertise to understand <laughs> the psychology behind the crazy that we are experiencing right now in our country. So buckle up, grab a couch, probably a stiff drink. You're going to need it as Mary Trump joins us here on the Michael Steele podcast right after this. Hey everybody, welcome to the Michael Steele Podcast. Yes, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, I, I was saying to Mary a little bit before we came on that uh, when I heard she was she had agreed to come on, I was like, yes, <laughs> great, great land. I love it. I love it. Mary, Mary, Mary. Oh, so good to have you with us, Mary Trump. Thank you so much for being on the Michael Steele Podcast. Oh, Michael, it's absolutely my pleasure. And as I said to you earlier, I feel like I've known you forever. So <laughs> it's it's bizarre to me that we haven't actually met in before. Yeah, I mean, really, it, it really is. Uh, and I think probably COVID interrupt us kind of probably forestalled a lot of that. But we, yeah. it's a real treat to get you on right now. One of the things I really want to get into to conversation with you and, and I'll be very straight up with you and 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 the listeners here I'm I'm not I don't want to get into the whole oh what's Donald Trump uh, da, da, da. I don't want to do that thank you I, I really because I've watched you handle that with a level of grace that at a certain point I would just say really <laughs> is that the only question you can ask me about this man um I want to broaden. I want to broaden our conversation out a little bit further because I, I I think it's important and and a little bit smart to tap into your background, your actual work. I mean, folks don't appreciate um, you are a PhD in in advanced psychological studies. You are um, someone who has dealt with trauma. Um, psychological issues that that human beings confront and deal with every day in their lives, developmental psychology. So I, I, I think it's, I think a good conversation for us is to talk about <laughs> what the hell is wrong with people? <laughs> what? Is it, is it, is it, is it something we're smoking or drinking or is, is it environmental? What the hell is our problem that we just? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> I got a couch. Let me, let me, let me lie down. <laughs> Actually, we need to put America on the couch. <laughs> That's what we need to do. <laughs> because it just, you know, I, I just really, and I want to start there from, from your observation. And, and you have a certain advantage point, obviously, because. <laughs> Your uncle's been the cause for a lot of the angst. Yeah. What what his can you kind of chart that line over time? Was this something that in that you saw earlier in your professional career before before Donald Trump got on the scene? Because I think there were some elements there potentially. What walk us through or at least beginning to set the stage of this conversation around what you've seen happening. With the psycho within the psychology of America, um, before your before Donald Trump showed up, yeah, I, you know, it's it's a really really good angle it would to come at this because uh, this isn't something that just happened, right? 
you know, you know this as well as anybody. Donald didn't change the party. He revealed something about it uh, that for various reasons, it was expeditious to keep under wraps, I suppose. <laughs> and he also gave people permission, those who, who wanted it and were willing to take advantage of it, to be their worst selves, which is why so many people got pushed out of the party right. and so many other people uh, like the new leaders of the party, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, mm-hmm. Matt Gates, decided to, that it was their time. Um, and they weren't wrong about this. So just as with Donald, it, it there is history here. And I think this is this might sound reductive, but I think it's absolutely true that the problem that have led us to this uh existential crisis we're facing is that America has never faced uh, its deepest, darkest issues. Uh, oh, yes. And, now we're talking, sister. Now we're talking. Right? And it's, you know, white people don't want to hear this and and even, even allies don't like facing this stuff. And I get it, but it's, it's time to own up to the fact that we are here because not only have we never atoned for our original sins, we've never properly acknowledged them. And yes. now Republicans want to erase them entirely. And part of that, it's not just the original sins of, of enslaving an entire race of people and destroying an entire other race of people, uh, but it's it's not owning what white people in America have gain from the advantage of white supremacy and white privilege. And I think when you confront people uh, that directly, they get defensive. Yeah, yeah, and, oh, very much so. And that's the problem. It's like, you, okay, you're not responsible. Nobody here is responsible for what happened 400 years ago. Those people are long dead. But that doesn't mean that we haven't benefited from the system that continues to this day to operate in America. Um, And Michael, I think that more than anything else is what keeps us uh, on the precipice of losing everything, not because of people on the right, but because people who really do believe in American democracy aren't willing to face issues head on because it hurts their feelings or something. That that is that is. I mean, I'm having a, a very cathartic moment right now because I've been trying to make this case for probably 25 years. <laughs> uh, that and and I put it this way, Mary. What ills America? What gnaws in her at her gut? Um, can never resolve itself until America decides to resolve the issue of black and white. Absolutely. It does, it's, it's not about border. It's not about the Asian community. It's not about Hispanics. It's not about the Germans or the uh, French or the Italians who came at the turn of the last century. It has been, and it will continue to be about the, the very intricate and delicate relationship between white people and black people. It is the essence of what the 1619 Project was trying to convey. It is what at a very high level, theoretical level, CRT tries to get into. You touched on the institutions that were created and formed to protect a certain type of identity. Uh, and to begin to establish a certain type of way of life that was very, very finely defined. It was not this all-inclusive, y'all come, yeah, we landed on the shores together, then we're going to do this together. It was like, we need you to build this stuff, we will own it, and maybe, maybe not, you get a piece of it at some point. Right. And the reality of that tension I think is has been a thread in our body politic, in our culture, in our economy, in our educational system forever. <laughs> and yeah. so to hear you put it in those terms to me is is really cathartic because at a certain point, I have to tell you, honestly, God, you begin to think, am I the only one who kind of sees this as really bottom line, a black, white thing? 
that touches on every aspect of what defines this country. And now we have expressed within the GOP this, this sort of defensive mechanism, mechanism in response that lashes out at CRT, lashes out at Black Lives Matters, lashes out at, you know, oh, well, you want my, my six-year-old white child to be responsible for your great, 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 great grandpappy's enslavement. Well, yeah. no, we don't yeah. want your child to be responsible for that. No one has ever said that. That's a that is a leap for you to make because you don't want to confront it. Right. And and instead, you're allowing the next generation to grow up ignorant of this real tension. And therefore, they won't be able to resolve it. Am, is, am I am I yeah. touching on anything here? Oh my God, <laughs> it's it's all true, and th there is a reason that they go after um, things like critical race theory, and there's a reason they're trying to whitewash American history and doing what people, you know, bullies and people in power often do is flip it around so it's the the oppressed and the victimized who are really the ones out yeah. to hurt you <laughs> you know yeah. like as if anybody's saying yes we want six-year-old white children to feel guilty about what happened 400 years ago and grow up with that burden but what they never talk about is the feelings of black children whose history is either erased or sanitized to the point at which they aren't even considered anymore. Like, what about those kids, right, who are already suffering from generational trauma? I'm and so glad you said that. <laughs> because, listen, the, I think part of the problem is the issue of racism, white supremacy, white privilege is foundational. So you get a lot of white people saying, well, it's over. Like, slavery is over. So what's the problem? And that's because we're taught so badly, white people, I should say, right. other people know this shit, just white people don't seem to, to seem to have grasped it. Because again, it they feel that it redounds to them somehow. But what about the 100 years of Jim Crow? What about redlining? What about uh, the GI Bill, which almost entirely excluded an entire generation yeah. of black men? Yeah. Um, being able to buy affordable homes, being able to go to college for nothing. Like that's generational wealth that has been on the one hand stolen and then on the other hand bestowed. Like it's not it's not an accident that white families have much more money in savings than black families. But of course, because there's no uh, desire on on this on the one side to explain it properly, the right is able to continue to promote their false narratives about why that is. Just like, you know, why are neighborhoods separated by race? Well, because they they have chosen to that, you know, it's de facto, not right. de jure, right? And it's not, It's it has been very carefully orchestrated throughout the decades that white and black remain separate, that white people benefit more. And because again, we are not made to understand that properly. All the tropes about laziness and about white superiority get perpetuated. And here we are still. And because of that, we are, again, constantly on this precipice of losing American democracy because, quite honestly, we've never grappled with the fact that America has never been a true democracy. So to, to okay, so put a pin in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put a pin in that. We're definitely coming back to that point. So from your from your what you just said, would you would you then agree or disagree, or what would be your thought about the uh, of the idea that that lack of cultural um, activism, in other words, actively acknowledging culturally, which feeds a lot of other things, right? It feeds mm -hmm. the educational system because a lot of people want well, education creates culture. Yeah, it does. But culture is really what we do before we know shit. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, at the yeah. end of the day. <laughs> 
right? Oh, yeah. it, it's 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 sort of a natural kind of vibe of how we sort of interact, and mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, my mama didn't know how to how to learn, you know, cook chicken from a from a cookbook, right? Right? She learned it by watching her mama cook it, who didn't have access to books, right? That's right. So that right. cultural piece later informs education and when you decide, oh, let, let's put it in a book and we'll call it, we'll right. call it knowledge. Um, so would you say then that that, that piece is what has um, moved the nation's politics in such a way that the politics now is all consuming? So in other words, these cultural things that we refuse to acknowledge and deal with have sat there germinating, and I would argue in some case rotting, yeah. um, because they've not been tended to properly. So all of that mess just kind of sits there and festers. It gets picked up politically. We can call it, uh, you know, Tea Party. We can call it... Uh, you know, MAGA, we can call it even on the left, you know, um, Occupy Wall Street, uh, you know, the harder edges of, of progressive uh, politics. Um, and it gets manifest and re recycled into um, both politics and culture, but then put it pushed out in other in other venues. So the politics now, because I had this conversation recently with with a couple of um, uh, religious people, pastors and priests, um, and I made the point that what I see happening to the church, whether it's the Catholic Church, the Evangelical Church, the Baptist Church, the you know even even among um, the Muslim faith, is the politics is driving uh, yep. the moral compass as opposed to the moral compass influencing the politics. Okay, there's a lot there. Um, well, I, I told you to bring a couch, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> you, you can't be on my, on my toes. Um, I definitely don't need a couch, other than for analysis purposes. But right. that's a separate issue entirely. Um, okay, so I think that the cultural rot has been accelerated by lack of political will to face uh the problems that have led to the cultural rot in the first place so in other words like the will of the the majority is infinitely wily so for example we need leadership we need right. the institutions that at least some of us trust and some of us probably shouldn't but you know uh to to tell us that the will of the majority is not always correct on the issues that's how we got brown v. board yes. of education yeah. right yeah that's how we got the the voting rights act and the civil rights act in 64 and 65 other way around however that wasn't the end of the conversation because then we got the uh school to prison pipeline you know right, and we right. got um all sorts of the uh subprime mortgage crisis which uh, disproportionately affected uh, families of color. Um, and then, of course, we get a Supreme Court led by a man who's one of whose missions in life seems to be to unravel voting rights in this country. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going backwards. And when decisions like that are handed down from all high, you've got a lot of people who aren't going to be thinking it through. They're just going to be saying, well, I guess if the Supreme Court says that, Right. And that must be OK. It, there must be a reason these particular people aren't being allowed to vote. There must be a reason that Republicans are gerrymandering districts so egregiously that Black people in Alabama effectively, for example, don't have any representation. There must be a reason, right? Otherwise, would, and it's the same thing, like you could use reparations as an example. That would have that needed to be done at the national level mm -hmm. and instead of being something that we debate about. It just should have been done, um, but it hasn't been. So therefore, well, how bad could it be? Like how big a disparity can there possibly be between a white American whose ancestors potentially enslaved people 
and got rich off of their free labor and black people who are the descendants of those whose labors and lives were stolen. And that's why you get people who say, well, you've elected a black man president. What's the problem? <laughs> they so desperately want to be let off the hook, Michael. It's incredible. It's just like, oh, wait a minute, you, you got elected officials. You got a you got a black vice president right now. What, what what's your problem? What are you complaining about? What are you complaining about? And it it and it is and it really does speak to the sort of the fact that as as the nation becomes more well attempts to lean more into its promise meaning its diversity its freedoms its the rights that are bestowed under our constitution there there feels like this retrenchment away from that this regression away from mm -hmm. that and it's like well yeah they wrote this, but they didn't write this document for you. They they wrote it for- Well, and they did it, by the way. So there's that. Right. They wrote it for our ancestors. And, and what I, you know, I get into conversation with people sometimes and I point out to, yeah, Thomas Jefferson wrote those wonderful words um, after he, you know, spent the evening with Sally Hemings. Um, and so, yeah, maybe she inspired some of that. Same, the same with a, a number of the white founders who had black mistresses um, and who were in many instances, as history and the records will show, uh, were, were very protective of them and did not treat them the way some of the other slaves may have been treated. Um, so there was a level of regard. They listened to them, et cetera. Um, it, it, this, this desire to just sort of whitewash or move out of frame the, the experience of African-Americans in creating the historic narrative of America, um, I think in, in the frustration for some is it's harder to do that now that the country is leaning more and more towards uh, a multicultural country, majority non-white country. Um, and this backlash is sort of manifesting itself uh, in our politics. It is the essence of the culture wars. It is, again, uh, more fuel in the, in the ongoing, you talked about redlining, Folks need to appreciate redlining isn't a thing of the past. It's happening right now. The gentrification of the city where I grew up, Washington, D.C., my mother, my parents and I were laughing recently because in my neighborhood where I grew up, Mary, my mother moved there in 1954, about that time. Yeah, because I think, yeah, because we, we burned the mortgage um, in 84. So... In 1954, she moves in, one of the first Black families to move in into that community. <laughs> White folks, they, they couldn't get out of there fast enough <laughs> to the point that by the time, by the time I was self-aware of my environments, which would, I was 58, so that probably when I was about eight or nine years old, there were two white families left in the community, right? So between 54 and, and 64, 10 years, um, you're talking two white families left. There was a white couple around the corner and there were two white spinster sisters who lived at the top of the hill. These two sisters never married, lived together at the top of the hill. But here's the funny part. Today, just this past weekend, I walked, they had in Petworth, Petworth Day. I laughed. My sister sent me a photo. I laughed so hard because it was nothing but white. <laughs> it was it nothing but white. And, my, and it reminded me of the conversation I had recently with my parents about, with particularly my mom, when she moved there, she was, I was like, yeah, now, now the grandkids 
of the white families that ran have come back and are buying up these homes. And now they're now they're millions of dollars. <laughs> That's right. Millions of dollars. Now, right. I grew up in a neighborhood that was largely, we were on the periphery of the 68 rise, which means that while our neighborhood wasn't burnt out, a lot of the commercial districts where we shopped were, and they sat burnt out for damn near 40 years, Mary. <laughs> so you see, you, you look at these storylines that Black people experience, and you hear people saying, well, we don't want to talk about that. I mean, where do we go as a country when a significant portion of the population don't want to talk about that? And and that is the portion of the population that actually matters for the purposes of moving us forward. We can't deal with, I'm at the point, I've been at this point for quite a long, long time. Anybody who voted for Donald Trump twice is of no interest to me whatsoever. Right. No, not None. Um, I was willing to make allowances after 2016, but after 2020, absolutely not. Um, I think the problem, there are a couple of problems. One is that from 2017 to 2019, that, you know, 28% of any population that should should basically just be kind of fenced off. Like, I think that's one of the one of the roles of liberal democracy is to kind of keep them away from the levers, levers of power. Yeah. They were represented by 100% of the government, federal government, because uh, they had the White House, they had the House, and they had and the Senate. Senate. Right. And that disease metastasized, which is, again, why 62 million right. people voted uh, to put a Republican in the Oval Office in 2016, and 74 million voted for the same thing And four years later, after the many disasters. So it just, it was sort of um, this quite terrifying phenomenon but again, there are more of us than there are of them. And the problem, again, is that group of people who really are on the side mm -hmm. of progress and um, diversity and democracy, who, for whatever reason, have a very, very difficult time owning up to the part they play. And this is this is how I feel about uh, white people in race. Uh, if the number of white people in this country who were, are not racist is vanishingly small because being racist is something that's done to you, right? It's drilled into you. If you grew up in this country in the 60s and 70s, good luck. Like if you, you know, had parents who drove, you know, you're driving along, suddenly you go through a black neighborhood and they surreptitiously lock the car door yeah. or, right? or they lower their voice when they say the word black, you know, so right. between no. that yeah. and between the media, media representation of crime and all of these other things, like they're escaping that would be very difficult because it starts, it's like you're indoctrinated almost. Um, so in order to make that, uh, to undo that, you have to go about it very consciously. Um, and that's very different being from being a racist. Being a racist is a choice. You're saying you believe in white supremacy. You believe that uh, other races of people are inferior. You believe you have more rights than other. I'm not talking about those people. Right. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, so-called well-meaning white people just who just can't face it because, I don't know, they, they feel guilty or they think it makes them look bad to admit it. But what I would say to those people is, listen, if it's something that was done to you, all you can do is take responsibility for undoing it, right? Now, if you, and if you do that, great, because that's right. going to make a, this a better. It's going to make you a better person. It's going to make us a better country. If you refuse to do that, then guess what? You own the problem you're trying to avoid. It's that, mm -hmm. in my view. No, I think that that's and that's the part where the honesty breaks down and the dishonesty steps in because people aren't honest about that point. They Wait, don't and I would want... say just really quickly that sure. only white people can make that argument and only white people should make that argument because we're responsible for it. Right, right. Yeah, no, it, it, I told y'all I brought my couch for this one because <laughs> I, I really, and I think it's important to kind of understand it uh, from someone who, um, experiences it, 
studied it, knows it, lives it, um, and and can give us some context because a lot of us don't get what is so hard about fixing the first problem, which is as a black man, as a white woman, we're having this conversation. So can we replicate this? Can we just have this like <laughs> as a national, you know, moment? Right. Uh, and the resistance to that, to me, is is still so stunning after so much of what the country has been through, so many moments where we've seen whites rally and blacks rally around the ideal of, of solving this problem um, so that we can move on and actualize the, the spirit of the Constitution and the founding uh, documents. But we can't because we're still stuck on whatever it is is holding us back from actually confronting the truth about each other. And and I think there's a symbiosis there. I really do. I think I think the 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 ravages of time and history have just sort of locked us together in a way that we just can't escape each other. Um, and and it's it is the best and the worst love story <laughs> America has to yeah. tell. Yeah. It really, it really is. It's so crazy. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, I'm going to readjust the pillows on my couch here and get ready for the next round with um, with Mary uh, Trump. I uh, really, really appreciate this conversation. I hope you do too. We'll be right back uh, with more with Mary right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to Michael Steele Podcast. We are speaking with uh, Mary Trump. Um author, uh, psychiat psychologist, um, and and someone who I think um, has sat at a very unique point in in this narrative, um, Mary. You, you have seen it because you know um, from one sense family history, so you've seen how <laughs> some of the some of the sauce was created. Um, but then you you also get to look at how it is impacting us culturally, politically, uh, societally. You recently had a discussion, for example, uh, on your podcast, The Mary Trump Show, um, which I highly recommend people uh, listen to because it it's fun and informative. Um, and you, in this particular episode, um, you were talking about mental health and incarceration uh, in the United States. And you pointed out, and it's something that I I got to know and appreciate as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, Maryland dealing with um, the, the criminal justice system in the state, that $31,000 a year is what it costs to incarcer incarcerate an individual. Whereas if we spent $10,000 a year, we could actually treat them much more comprehensively within their community through community health services centers, et cetera. A, why don't we do that? Okay, so I'll just start there. Why don't we do that? But then B, what does that say? And maybe this feeds the answer to A, about from a psychiatric perspective, what we need to do to do it. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of a depressing answer. Um, it, it's sort of a two part answer, and and it the first part also explains a lot about our current situation, whether it's the debt ceiling or gun safe gun issues or what have you. It's much if you're willing to lie. It's much easier to lie uh, in a witty way that fits on a bumper sticker <laughs> than it is to counter the lie with educated, comprehensive responses, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of it. It's just easier to talk, you know, punishing makes us safer or what have you. Right. Uh, or, you know, mental illness is weakness and it's lack of character and whatever, uh, or it's too expensive. 
Yes. But, you know, who's yes. crunching the numbers? Who's crunching the numbers? Nobody's crunching the numbers. And it kind of makes sense that it would be more expensive to treat people and make sure they're cared for as opposed to just jumping them in a, a cage. Um, the other problem is more cultural. Um, we, this, America has become an extraordinarily punitive society. Yes. I think it always has been, but it's kind of gotten worse in the last seven years. And it's also a country based on this total myth of rugged individualism. So, you know, if you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps, why should I pay for you? And like, there's, there, what gets left out of that equation is that punishing people is literally and figuratively very expensive and it costs everybody. Mm -hmm. Like leaving, you know, for example, if people don't have healthcare and their primary care physician is the emergency room, who's paying for that? Right. Like you right. may think oh, it's not fair for people who don't work to have healthcare, but you know what? It's going to make your taxes go up. So I think, and this, this also has to do with uh, the issue of race. And I, I personally hate having to make this argument because we shouldn't have to, but we have to engage people's self-interest. It is bad for you on a human level, on an economic level, on a socioeconomic level, to allow other people in this society to fail, even if you hate them. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that'll challenge your 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 uh, your notions of a lot of things, because well, and, yeah. and actually, in in a very interesting twist, that is sort of the economic argument of the Gospels in some respects. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you but know? Yeah. But instead, and this is really interesting, and it's something that people need to understand is still operative. It was back when um, Black people were being enslaved, and there were still white indentured servants and Black indentured servants. Wealthy white landowners understood that if Black and white working class indentured servants, enslaved people, if th those economic forces came together, leaving aside race white wealthy landowners would be in a lot of trouble yeah, <laughs> so yeah. what they did is they sold white workers a bill of goods saying that you know enslaved people are your uh com com competitors and um you have something much more valuable than making common cause with them and that's your whiteness and your well, that right argument is still the one that's being made today. Exactly. But it goes back that far. And that's what I'm saying. Like, this is so nothing has changed and people keep failing to under imagine. Imagine if the working class, which always only refers to the white working class. Right. Imagine if the working class were all working class people striving together towards the same goal. Imagine the power of that. But no, they knew if they allowed that to happen, rich people would lose out. Well, you know, I you would be okay with that. You raise a very interesting point because one of the um, interesting sort of co conclusions that I've sort of come to and watched play out, um, particularly with respect to the, to the nature of whiteness in America, I was got into a conversation many years ago with some buddies and we were talking about immigration. And I was making the point, which was roundly rejected and told me I was crazy that, well, immigration um, has always been a challenge for, for an interesting class of, of Americans that were largely uh, Puritan, okay, in, in many respects, from a religious yep. um, perspective, um, certainly um, upper, upper class, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what we saw when Germans, French, you know, Irish, especially Polish, 
all of these immigrants came to the country in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they were segregated into ghettos, right? So you had the Polish ghetto, you had the German ghettos, the Italian ghettos, and we know the stories from New York to, you know, um, uh, wherever uh, about how th how these people made it in America. And yet that sort of upper crust sort of Puritan, Episcopalian kind of, you know, mm -hmm. wealth oversaw that system yep. and segregated those white folks. What I, my argument then went on was what was interesting was when the Polish and, and the, the Irish and the Italians started seeing themselves as white. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when things started to change. And the reality, the reality was one that put, put the country in a very different bucket. Um, and, and all of a sudden, all of those folks who were once segregated were now part of the class that was segregating. Yeah. And my friends looked at me and said, man, you smoke way too much weed. And I went, no, <laughs> think about it. <laughs> think of, but that was then now in that conversation, they get it. They're like, yeah, that. I see that arc because a lot of those, and we see that same kind of narrative evolving, interestingly enough, between certain Asian groups and certain Hispanic groups uh -huh. who try to project themselves as white because uh -huh. of their fair skin. Uh -huh. And and ironically, that's something that, that Black folks, even fair-skinned Black folks, still had a hard time doing, uh, trying to pass, because invariably... People were seeking them out and trying to catch them doing that, you know. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but absolutely. it's an interesting this this desire to be white has been an underlying theme for this country for a long time, and of course, it comes crashing down hard when it comes to black folks because <laughs> they like, can't assimilate. You know, my hair wasn't my hair wasn't straight and <laughs> my skin wasn't light, so yeah, deal and with it. And that's, I think, what what uh, the that that uh, process or that trend towards assimilation revealed what a what a hoax it all was. Because yes, they um, lots of psychologists and uh, who were were complicit in this, and they invented their racist IQ tests. And yeah, they put they put all the different races because you know Irish people were considered. A different race and right. discriminated against in in Great Britain, uh, and here initially. So they put all of the different races along a continuum, and you know nobody was as superior as the white people, but of course nobody was inferior as the black people. And again, as as different groups started assimilating and identifying as white and being allowed to identify as white, right. It became pretty clear that the only two races we we're talking about here were white and black, and that there was no hierarchy uh, in the middle. It was just white up here, black down here, and anybody else who can assimilate, go for it. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that remains operative is because white people with power have been able to convince white people without power, not only that their whiteness has incredible value, which it does, mm -hmm. um, but also that it doesn't matter how well they do. The thing that matters most is that other people, in this case, Black people, do worse. So they're willing to put up with a hell of a lot of horrible things like no health care, terrible education, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for that very reason, for that ability to feel superior to an entire race of people. So that that puts into context um, a conversation I had many years ago with a representative from the state of Mississippi who made a public statement uh, that inferred that the the vast majority of the poor in his district were Black. 
And I had, you know, because there's this equivalency, if you're black, you're poor, if you're poor, you're black. The press reinforces that narrative. It's the same thing with crime. You know, first thing you hear about, you know, today there was a violent crime that occurred. Oh, okay, yeah, let's see who that is. Um, Until I pointed out to him that the vast majority of the people who are on the dole on welfare in his congressional district are white. They're not black. In fact, most black people in your congressional district are doing very well. <laughs> Thank you very much because yeah. they're not they're they've not gotten caught up into the poisonous narrative that you are clearly espousing. So is 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 the idea that I mean when you look at Appalachia, you look at places like Mississippi, the poorest state in the union, the white leadership that clearly is not doing anything to change their circumstances mm-hmm. and yet are pointing finger at fingers at black ghettos, yep. urban America, and looking at the crime, looking at the poverty, looking at the poor education. I'm like, dude, have you checked out your own backyard? All, all those white people who are living, in many instances, much harsher existence than the black folks, because at least the black folks are like, well, you offered me free cheese. (laughs) I'm going to go get the free cheese. (laughs) I mean, Michael, that is such a good point. Not only are the white people in these incredibly poor areas of the country suffering, they're voting for people who only will increase their size. (laughs) Nope, you Medicaid is not going to cover dental, they say to the people who are suffering from from, you know, dental, I don't know anything about disease. Yeah, I mean, mouth disease. I mean, all kinds of stuff going on in their mouth. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know if anybody ever needed a root canal, but it's really painful to have untreated uh, dental issues. And, and, you know, but no, keep voting for people who will refuse to help you with that. And it's one of the greatest scams. It's that it is very difficult to um, get through to people uh, who can maybe get a message out if they continue to buy in this to this idea that these people in these rural poor white districts are voting against their self-interest. No, they're not because their greatest self-interest is making sure that other people are doing worse than they are. So let's bring it full circle. And let's apply what we've learned <laughs> to our politics in this upcoming election cycle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Donald Trump has got his own issues. He's going to deal with that. And, and I think in large measure, be unfazed by it because, you know, I, I talk to Republicans are like, well, you know, Donald Trump may not be the top of the ticket. I said, that's probably that's that's not that's not necessarily a good thing for the party. <laughs> do you think this man goes quietly to any good night? I mean, do you really think that happens? Oh, there's but, only one way that happens, and I'm not going to say it out loud. Exactly. So so let's look at now having some baseline understanding of what was driving a lot of this, what what is animating folks um, in many respects. When you're looking at this upcoming presidential cycle, you've already mentioned the fact that between 16 and 20, there was not a loss for for Trumpism or uh, the MAGA uh, way. It increased by seven plus million more voters. Yeah. Looking at this from a psychologist, a clinical psychologist perspective, <laughs> how do you assess the behavior that we're about to? I mean, what what is the early view of how voters look at this when they're confronted with the the stresses and strains of democracy? You made the point before that we're not a real democracy. Some some have made that case. Um, how do people process that? Uh, do they really know what that means, being a republic versus being a, 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 a full-blown democracy? Um, yeah, well, I, can I just interject for a second? Oh, do you think? Yeah. Because I think it's really important to make this distinction. 
When I say that when Republicans say America is not a democracy, it's a constitutional republic, they're lying to you. It's a constitutional republics are types of democracies. Right. When I say America right. isn't a democracy, I simply mean America has never reached its potential because throughout its history, huge blocks of people, first it was all black people and women, and then it was all women, and then and now it's due to gerrymandering and voter suppression and voter subversion in some cases, it's selected groups of people that right. Republicans just want to have vote and it's because of the Supreme Court. It's not because America isn't on paper a democracy. I just right. want to be really clear about that. Right. No, no, and that's and that's a fair point because it is it's important to understand that that is the, the narrative for the countries that we're always striving towards that more yeah. perfect union, which is the manifestation of a full blown democracy. Right. Um, and, and yet we still trip over those things that, that make it more difficult for us to reach those goals. And this cycle that we've been in starting in 2015, 2016 is a good example yeah. of, of how we trip over ourselves in our journey towards that democracy, because we then it's all in, in, a, in many respects, Mary, it's a lot like a race where runners are running, right? And you're looking to your right, you're looking to your left. And if I can get you off track a little bit, I have the advantage. And that goes to the last point you were making for a lot of these, these white voters who are you know, mired in very difficult situations, the rationale is, well, but theirs is worse than mine. Yep. Um, and 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 instead of saying, why don't we kind of pull together and get out of this mess together? Right. Um, and and so that that feeds a lot of storylines um that get that get warped by the partisan politics of the moment. You've got the storyline about Joe Biden, elderly, white man, don't know what time of day it is, et cetera. Um, the storylines about, you know, Donald Trump, um, you know, authoritarian, anti-democratic, and the country sort of sitting there looking at that and not assessing authentically, well, neither one of those options are good. How do I take control of this? Right. What, yeah. what is what is what is what is it about us that prevents us from unelecting those bad people who keep us mired in this this narrative and electing and reelecting bad people who just take it to the next level of perpetuation? Yeah, I think it's going to take a massive shift that is going to have to be in place for a long time. Like we cannot. It's untenable for every election to be about whether or not American democracy survives. Right. And just to be clear, I want I think it's very important to put it in those terms. We can't be nuanced about this right now. For our intent, for all intents and purposes, America is a democracy. And the choice in 2024, just as it was in 2022, is between democracy and autocracy. Right. It's Period. that simple. Uh, Once yeah. we make sure we're safe, then we can deal with making it a better democracy. Right. Right. Um, so I think it's difficult because, again, those those white people, it's not only that they care about um, being better off than or other people being worse off, I should say. Right. They've also been convinced that those people are their enemies. And um, this is something that the right is expert at because it has no scruples about playing with people's lives. They make people terrified. And um, being afraid feels awful. It's an awful way to feel. What feels better than being afraid? Being angry. Mm. So they sort of mm. transform the fear into anger against the other, right. whatever that might be. And in a weird way, um, because they their fear and anger have been stoked for so long and you know, they need more and more of it. It's like any drug, you need more and more of it to kind of get your high. Um, what's happening is it like energizes them, like it energizes them when Republicans create cruel, uh, pass cruel legislation or um, 
it it energizes them when um you know donald gets away with something or what have you right it demoralizes the rest of us and we're exhausted so it puts us in an even weaker position especially again when the right has no problem with hypocrisy biden's old well i'm sorry but 76 and 80 Right. <laughs> you know, Biden's yes. got uh, serious mental issues. Well, let's play the tape, you know. So <laughs> it's just it's really tough to kind of keep banging our heads against it. And I think we need to stop trying and just focus on what I would say to anybody, because, again, the only people who are going to get us out of this mess are people who the people who voted for Biden in, in 2020. Right. And to them, I would say. Did you think he was going to get younger? Like, what, what, what did you think was going to happen? That's actually, you know, that's a good question. That's a, duh. And do you really think that four years of, four more years of Biden is worse than the alternative? Duh. But again, the problem, and, you know, because Republicans are, they want their illegitimate minority power at all costs. What are they? Nikki Haley, the first one to to uh, take the shot. Well, if you're voting for Biden, you're really voting for Kamala Harris because right. he's going to die right after the election day. Yeah, he's going. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> just the shame. And I, someone needs to whisper to Nikki, "Your tomorrow ain't promised, sister." No <laughs> so don't, don't, you know, don't go, don't go talk about what's going to happen to somebody else before you recognize that Seriously. God may have, maybe it may have just counted down your numbers. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Jeez. She, she just, doesn't want to be throwing those particular stones. I don't you think. really don't. You really don't. Mary Trump, you have, you have made this a very interesting and enjoyable conversation for me. Um, I, you know, I, I know a lot of folks are like, oh, well, you know, let's talk about Donald. Neither one of us want to really want to talk about Donald, so we wanted no, to talk you. about something a little bit, a little bit uh, more important about how we are actually all kind of tied together in this, folks. Um, and you know, hope you have a little bit better understanding why you stopped wanting to go to Grandma's for Thanksgiving, <laughs> and and why and why Uncle Charlie, you just you know, you just like nah, I can't go visit him this month. Um, and we, we've got to help ourselves get out of this rut that we find ourselves in. Um, and if we want this grand experiment to continue and to survive, and it requires us to, to, to be honest about our history, uh, to be honest about where we are right now in order for any idea of what the future is going to look like to make sense in my view. And Mary, you helped, uh, help. Me, at least. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of y'all out there. but <laughs> well, I hope I helped a little. But she seriously, helped Michael, me. It's such a, it's such a pleasure. I've really been looking forward to this and to have the luxury of so much time. You know, uh, it's it's. I think it's so important for people to hear in-depth conversations, um, you know, of, of people who with, well, I, I, I'm not going to say mutual, but like I respect you and 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 your work and um, the work you continue to do, and we, you know we need we need to help people understand stuff, and um, it's it's the only way through. It's the only way through. <laughs> really. It really is. It really is. It's the only way through. Um, and you know, look, I, I tell my Democratic friends and, and my liberal friends all the time, y'all have enough time to cuss me out again in the future. Trust me. You know, when we get to back it. to talk about policy and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I get it. But right now, um, we are we're on the same front line fighting the same challenge in front of us um, so that we can have those big debates uh, and those little debates yeah. over over big and small policy issues and and the, the direction of the country, et cetera. Uh, but we got to we got to agree first that we all think there should be a country. <laughs> because some of That's us right now place to start yeah right some of us have a different set of opinions on that bad boy mary trump uh she is a clinical psychologist she is the author 
of the book Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man. It's an international bestseller, by the way. So <laughs> she had people sitting overseas going, Mary, please <laughs> help me help me understand what the please tell hell. Me this is fiction. <laughs> tell me this is fiction. Mary was like, nah, that was my childhood. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> But I really appreciate you coming on and spending some time and just sort of taking us to a different level in the conversation and understanding how all of this stuff is starting and not just starting to fit together, has come together um, uh, in the first place. And I look forward to having you back on. I really do. And I look, I like to come hang out at your shop every once in a yeah, while. I'd love absolutely. to come and do the Mary Trump show. Oh my God. I would be thrilled. I would absolutely, we will make that happen. We will make that happen. I'm looking forward to it. Mary, thanks again. And I want to thank all of you for uh, taking the time to be a part of the conversation today. Uh, please follow Mary on Twitter at Mary L Trump. Uh, have you broken off to any other space besides Twitter since Twitter is such a shit show right now. No, I'm I'm still in mourning. <laughs> You're still in mourning. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm I'm like that guy who comes to the to the wake with his forty, um, and and you know mourns in the moment, but then goes outside looking for another date. You know, so that's kind of like it's just. <laughs> yeah, I'll head over to Spoutable at some point. I'm just that's not, where I am. That's I'm where I am yet. as well. So, but check her out on Twitter at Marielle Trump and uh, certainly uh, love the podcast for us um, uh, as well. It's uh, the Mary Trump uh, show. Uh, check that out. Check out uh, my podcast at podcast, uh, excuse me, at Steel underscore podcast and me at Michael Steele on Twitter and Spottable. Uh, until next time, folks, uh, be be careful out there. Take care of yourselves. There, there's a lot of crazy going on. I want you back here next time we're together, all right? Until then, I'm Michael Steele.